Well, it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome you all here tonight. Uh, this is the uh, first event we're holding in uh, Weihai's newly refurbished lecture theatre, so it's a very auspicious occasion and it's great to see so many people here. Um, I'm David Vo, the Assistant Director at Weihai, and I know nothing about celiac disease. Uh, this evening's talks are being held here in conjunction with Celiac Victoria and Tasmania, and I'd especially like to welcome uh, those members that are here tonight. At WEHI, our research on celiac disease has been spearheaded by Dr. Bob Anderson and Dr. Jason Tidin. And this research provides a very nice example of research that has begun in the laboratory but has transitioned very rapidly into the clinic. I'm not sure when Bob first started working on celiac disease. My guess is in the late 1990s, but I'm sure you'll hear a lot more about that from him. Yet here we are already hearing about potential new treatments. Now at WEHI, we're especially proud of the discoveries that have been made here in the lab and have actually made a difference to patients. Uh, Professor McFarlane Burnett was one of the previous directors here at WEHI, and his technique for growing influenza virus in chicken eggs, uh, together with Alfred Gottschalk's identification of the sugars on the surface of influenza virus particles and Peter Coleman's crystallisation of neuraminidase and the development of Relenza, uh, the, the best treatment for influenza, uh, that took uh, uh, over 80 years. Uh, Don Metcalf is, uh, is somebody who's worked at Weihai since the 1960s. His research on blood cell growth factors uh, 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 and, uh, and, and it's taken over 25 years for that research uh, to be used in the clinic where these growth factors are used to uh, boost the white blood cell numbers in patients uh, treated for cancer. And it's been almost 25 years since the first research at Weihai on cell death and new drugs that activate cell death mechanism in cancer cells uh, have not yet completed trials at uh, RMH and the Peter McCallum Hospital. So there have been a number of success stories at WEHI, but you can see it often takes a very long time for discoveries in the lab to reach the clinic. And yet, as you will see, the research by Bob Anderson and his very small team has gone a very long way in a short time. So we're very proud of them. But first, I'd like to introduce you to uh, tonight's Master of Ceremonies, and that's uh, Jane Davies of Celiac Victoria and Tasmania. Thank you, David, and on behalf of Celiac Victoria and Tasmania, I'd like to welcome you all for coming along tonight. Before we begin, I'd like to take a, a quick opportunity to outline the role of Celiac Victoria and Tasmania. Our main role, obviously, is to provide information and support those that are diagnosed with celiac disease, as well as their families, friends, people with dermatitis epidermis, as well as those medically diagnosed as requiring a gluten-free diet at a state level, so we're part of the national body, Celiac Australia. We provide information about the gluten-free diet, the ingredients in foods, where to buy gluten-free food, recipes, cooking, eating out, overseas travel and research. We have information seminars, cooking demonstrations, gluten-free expos and children's events are held every year. In the state office and regions around across the state, volunteers assist um, us to provide a strong network of support for members. And we have a really passionate team of volunteers and staff, and most of them either have celiac disease themselves or a close member of their families. Celiac Australia is fortunate enough to have a panel of medical and health professionals behind them who advise on the best practice for diagnosis and management of celiac disease and ensures we remain up to date with the current celiac disease management and gluten, -free and gluten research. A medical advisory consists of leading adult and paediatric gastroenterologists, immunologists, general practitioners and dietitians, some of who are here this evening. But I'm sure you have come to this evening to hear more about our main topic, a global perspective of developing a non-dietary treatment for celiac disease. So I'd therefore like to introduce Dr. Evan Newnham, who is a gastroenterologist actively involved in research into celiac disease. 
Evan is the Director of Medicine and Senior Lecturer at Monash University at the Anglers Hospital and, the, and consults in the Celiac and Inflammatory Bowel Disease Clinics at Box Hill Hospital. In addition to these roles, Evan is continuing PhD research at Box Hill Hospital into therapies for newly diagnosed celiac disease and the cognitive impacts of, esta of established celiac disease. So this evening, Dr. Evan Newman will be speaking on the future directions in the management of celiac disease. I'd like you all to please make him welcome. Thanks, Jane. Um, so thanks for this opportunity. So what I'm going to try and do over the next 20, 25 minutes is just give you a bit of a background in celiac disease um, and also just some research that's been going on around the world as well as locally. Um, so I don't have any conflicts to declare. So the first thing is, um, so what's celiac disease? So um, you all know this, I'm sure, but it's important that we understand where we're starting. So it's a genetically determined uh, it's, so they have to have the right genes to develop this condition. Um, it's an immune response, so the immune system is very intimately involved in this process. Um, and it's an re immune response to ingested gluten in susceptible individuals that results in small bowel inflammation. So all very straightforward. So if we look at this schematically, this is your, your, your guts. Um, and if you look at that under the microscope, that's what it looks like on the left-hand side. So a good outline of the, the small bowel and what it looks like. So if we dissect this in a little bit more detail, as I say, this is, it's all very scientific, but it's all very important as to what I'm going to talk about in the next several slides. So if we break this down into processes, in people with celiac disease, they ingest gluten. Um, they're able to break down this gluten to a certain point, but they're not able to get beyond the left-hand protein, which is this 33-mer that um, Bob's been responsible for and it really enhanced our understanding of celiac disease. Somehow, this compound gets across the small bowel mucosa. Um, we don't really understand that process very well, but it gets across. And tissue transglutaminase, this TTG, which is the antibody that many of you would have been diagnosed with, um, deamidates this um, protein and presents it to T cells. And this is where the genes are really important. So um, we need to have the right genes to, to develop celiac disease. And following this process, so following this interaction between the immune system and your genetic profile, there's an inflammatory process that takes place. And that inflammatory process results in the villus atrophy that we know represents celiac disease. And this is what it looks like to us at endoscopy and under the microscope. So the top two pictures are normal, and the bottom two pictures represent celiac disease. So with the naked eye, in the top left-hand picture, you can actually see the villi. So all of those little markings in the small bowel are villi. Um, and this is what it should look like normally. So long, slender villi. This is actually a picture on the bottom slide from a capsule endoscopy. But you can see there's little pits that are taken out from the small bowel, which are not present in the top picture, and completely flattened mucosa. And that is celiac disease. Um, not to get too detailed in all of this, but we can score these abnormalities, and the MARSH scoring system is what is accepted um, as being the scoring system um, from normal looking villi with a little bit of inflammation to completely flattened villi, and it's scored through those. It is important that we just understand this uh, for what I'm going to talk about. So there's been a shift, and at the, at the first celiac conference that I went to um, in Amsterdam four years ago, that uh, Peter Green, who's another Australian um, studying celiac disease from the United States, opened his um, opened the conference with a talk about the changing face of celiac disease, and it is changing. So this chap, William Deacon, in the 1950s, he really sort of thought about celiac disease a lot and really promoted what celiac disease is, but. This is the stereotype that he saw, and this is the stereotype that I grew up with as a medical student, this sort of wasting and uh, protein calorie malnutrition. Um, but that's very much changed. So we're seeing people with, from different races, we're seeing people from, with different ages, um, we're seeing underweight people, overweight people, average body mass index people. It's very, very much a changing pattern of what we're seeing nowadays. The way we treat celiac disease is also changing. So this is the traditional paradigm that most would have adopted in the past. So we, we see people, would have seen people who have presented with symptoms, they've then undergone endoscopy, we've then prescribed a gluten-free diet, and that's been it. Um, that's really been the, the paradigm that had been practiced in the past, and that, that's changing as well. 
So what are we trying to achieve in managing celiac disease? So we want to improve symptoms and quality of life, but we're increasingly seeing, and probably about a fifth of patients nowadays are presenting without symptoms, which is a challenge for us. Um, we want to avoid the complications of celiac disease. We want to normalise celiac antibodies, but what if they're normal at diagnosis? That's a problem. Um, and we want to heal the small bowel. This is a condition that's very much defined by what's going on in the small bowel, and it would be nice to be able to heal the small bowel in managing it. So does a gluten-free diet achieve these goals? Um, so when I sit in one of the clinics that I work in is an inflammatory bowel disease um, clinic. When I sit down and manage people with inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, I can choose from all of these treatments. So you've got ASA agents and these medications that are suppress the immune system, thiopurines, methotrexate, these biologic agents, which are very expensive drugs, all funded through the government on the PBS and corticosteroids. For celiac disease, I get, I get a choice of one. Um, <laughs> now, that's fine, um, assuming it works. Um, so that's a, it's, it's an accepted thing, but there is a big assumption that it works, and that's been the assumption that perhaps has held back research into therapeutics. It's been the presumption that it does work, and that it works well. So the problems with a gluten-free diet are numerous. So what is gluten-free? So definitions vary between countries and um, regions as to what gluten-free represents, how many parts per million. Um, the palatability varies. We're very lucky in Melbourne and Australia with the choice that we have. Um, you can go to very high quality restaurants with gluten-free alternatives um, and good gluten-free alternatives. Compliance is a problem. So depending on the population you look at, if you look at Italian populations, half of the population with celiac disease are compliant with a gluten-free diet. Um, and it's expensive. So the, the states have got good information on this and up to $2,500 a year. Um, now that in Australian dollars, that's doing so well, maybe that's not so bad, but it's still expensive. Um, quality of life varies. So there have been different studies done and some, some studies of quality of life is good, some bad. Um, it's also socially isolating. I think one of the hardest things for us as gastroenterologists is ma managing adolescence um, in terms of just managing that time period where you're going out and socialising and managing that time period. It's, it's difficult. Um, the big problem is it's not a drug, so it's difficult to... This is the realities of um, modern medicine, is, is getting pharmaceutical companies to provide support to a disease that previously hasn't had um, drug information available or drug options. Um, the other problem really is the efficacy, which is something that we're going to talk a little bit about now. So, firstly, symptoms. So, the, the traditional paradigm, gluten-free diet, everyone gets better, no problems. Um, this is a study which was touting how effective the gluten-free diet is at relieving symptoms. But if you look at all of those symptoms, this is sort of a median of six months after starting a gluten-free diet. Yes, a lot of those things get better, but there's still a lot of people with symptoms after that six months, and certainly the clinics that we work in that are celiac disease clinics, um, we see a lot of people who still have ongoing symptoms despite fairly religiously following a gluten-free diet. So it's not necessarily the be-all and end-all. So this is a study that was conducted through Eastern Health, um, and we looked at 45 people, followed them prospectively on a gluten-free diet for five years, and these are their antibodies after five years on a gluten-free diet. And these were all very reliable people who'd been taught for a year um, how to follow a gluten-free diet at, at, at time zero and time 12 months. And even after five years of fastidiously adhering to a gluten-free diet, um, there's still 14 people of those 40 who had positive antibodies. Um, and the positive predictive value and negative predictive value of, those, of these antibodies in predicting healing of the small bowel is not very good. You don't want 50% and 50% is not a good positive and negative predictive value for these tests. So we also looked at the small bowel. Apologies for the movement of these slides. But we looked at this, this same population, we looked at their small bowel and what it looked like under the microscope. Um, this is at year at the, at the baseline, so the beginning of the study. So as you would expect, so the worse your histology, so the worse that your small bowel looks is on the right hand side, the better it looks is on the left. So obviously no one at the beginning had normal small bowel, which is marsh zero, and a lot of people had marsh 3A, 3B or 3C, which is villous atrophy. So again, these people have followed a gluten-free diet for five years um, and followed it as far as we can assess very well for those five years. 
So after five years, um, there was still a significant portion who had inflammation. So you can see there that um, healing was, if you take MARSH0, which is a normal small bowel as being healing, was only achieved in 50% of people, so half of people after five years. If you want to take a positive spin on it, um, there was significant recovery. So if you look at MARSH1, which is a little bit of inflammation, um, that was achieved in almost 90%. So not too bad, but still not 100%. Um, so that's sort of food for thought in terms of the efficacy of a gluten-free diet. And that's, this is not just the Australian population. If you look at international publications, the figures are actually worse than this. So this, was a, this is a good result when you look at the literature. Um, one of the questions is, why, why should we heal the small bowel? Should this be our aim, or is it good enough just to say that people are feeling a little bit better? Um, this has been looked at. And one, one argument is that it's logical that we should be trying to heal something that we've found is, is abnormal. But more than that, it's the um, only reliable way that we have to look at people with, who are, have no symptoms. And in addition to that, it's, it's probably, and we don't have great studies to rely on, but it's probably associated with poor outcomes. So osteoporosis, immune diseases, quality of life, cancers. Very much cancer has been overstated in the literature in celiac disease in the past decades. There's a little bit of an increased risk. Um, whether healing reduces that risk is still a little bit controversial. Um, and we don't have great studies to rely on to draw all of these conclusions, unfortunately. So the other issue driving alternatives is that you want something else. So this was a study that was done in the UK. It looked at 310 <coughs> patients. Um, and 42% of them, these were randomly selected patients on a gluten-free diet, uh, were dissatisfied with a gluten-free diet. Um, and they were all asked what they would prefer to be, sort of have as their alternative. Um, Good news for Bob and others, the vaccine was 42% um, would prefer that. Anti-zonulin drugs, we'll talk about what these drugs are a bit later. Um, peptidase is a quarter. But the genetically modified wheat, which is I'll talk again about a little bit later as well, was not high on people's list. And I think there's a bit of fear about genetically modified wheat and that, that gets bad press, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your point of view. So having established that there are problems, that there's really what I'm going to spend the rest of the talk um, discussing is the therapeutics in celiac disease. So is this, is this the next frontier in gastroenterology? So again, we're going to return to this slide several times. So one option you have is to sort of pre-digest wheat so that you uh, lose this 33-mer, this immunostimulatory peptide. So this has been looked at by Jason and others. So this compound ALV003. So it's a mixture of these prolyl endonopeptidases and glutenases, and basically this is these are just digested. Um, so the interesting thing about this is the un this these sorry I can't point this again. So the um, these dots were people who received placebo. So everyone who received um, gluten as part of their um, initiation into this study. None of them developed an immune response. However, several of the placebo patients did develop an immune response to the ingested gluten. So if they'd been treated, they didn't develop this immune response. And this shows some promise. The difficulties are that it's, it's palatability. We were just talking before about the palatability of this. It was called a slurry in the study. Um, and it seemed to be an adequate um, explanation for it. But, but this, is, this is early days. Um, and th th there are sort of issues with the practicalities of how this fits into a gluten-free diet and what, what sort of advantages this might offer. So bugs are important in celiac disease, strangely. You wouldn't necessarily think that um, bacteria and other things would have an important role. So all of these bugs have got their individual roles in celiac disease and therapeutics. So the, this first one um, is a lactobacillus. So you can pre-digest wheat and sourdoughs and breads have been pre-digested with lactobacillus and various other bacteria to try and break down um, the 33-ma again into sort of a better, more favourable compound. Um, the difficulty with some of these studies is that the outcomes have been sort of intestinal permeability and, and fairly loose outcomes rather than histology um, and it needs a lot more work before this really gets a lot further um, in terms of studies. So back to the photo. So we've got this process here which we can also target. So barrier integrity is also important in celiac disease um, and again the bugs get a, get a word in. 
So this bug here, this is Clostridium. So what role? So not Clostridium, it's uh, cholera. Um, so this is a this is a, what role, what possible role could uh, cholera have in celiac disease? Well, we know that um, the way that cholera causes problems is that it affects these junctions between cells. So through all these fancy processes that I'm not going to go through. But the reason you become so unwell from it is that the, pro the, the water that you lose is a result of the disruption of um, this tight junction. So this compound, lorazotide, um, what we're looking at here is that, again, this is the tight junction here, and we're looking down on all of these cells. So these are the um, control cells before any exposure. If you give gluten the disruption, you can see that this pattern is completely lost, whereas if you give it in the setting of this compound, lorazotide, the tight junctions are preserved. So it sounds attractive, sounds like a good treatment, and there was a lot of work that went into showing that zonulin and these other compounds were very overly expressed in celiac mucosa, um, but that the trials haven't been particularly <coughs> mind-blowing in terms of their results. So it's very well tolerated, um, it's early trials, there's more trials needed, but the only thing they were really able to hang a hat on was this intestinal permeability, so a lactulose to mannitol ratio, which is not a very good outcome when you look at sort of studies across the board. Um, so more work is undergoing, but we haven't, I haven't, certainly haven't heard anything recently about how those studies are going. So the other thing which I think is not something that's been studied well in celiac disease, but I think is something you're probably going to hear about in due course, is vitamin D and its role in uh, the gut barrier. So. Um, we know that vitamin D deficiency is common in celiac disease, um, whether that's through malabsorption or increased utilisation through inflammation, um, but it's increasingly we're finding its role in physiology beyond um, what we thought was just its relation to bones. Um, it, it, it's it been studied in inflammatory bowel disease. Um, it has a clear role in the maintenance of tight junction structure in the gut. Um, and it's a fairly easy therapy to access um, that, it, that probably warrants some interrogation in celiac disease. Um, and it won't be, I don't think it'll be long before someone takes this idea further. So back here. So there are other options. So we can use anti-transglutaminases. So the tissue transglutaminase that I was talking about before. Um, you can get reversible and irreversible inhibitors of transglutaminases. Um, but the problem is the tissue transcontaminase isn't just found here, it's found in lots of other tissues, and therefore toxicity is associated with those. Um, and there, there are also independent processes of tissue transcontaminase that are bypassed that, uh, that won't be encountered by tissue transcontaminase um, binders. So the other option we have is to block this genetic interaction. Um, there's difficulty in gaining access to this, so if you were to invent a drug, it has to cross the mucosa, then inhibit this interaction. That's not straightforward. Um, but they've been designed, so they've been able to establish what this looks like, develop it, um, and it, it may be something of the future. So this interaction here, as I said, it's, it's necessary and sufficient for celiac disease, and with this sort of binding groove, if you like, um, it has to be very specific. So people have looked at trying to change this, and if you change one of these um, round circles, you can change this interaction dramatically. So you can use wheat modification. Um, so we know that in general over the centuries, the gluten content in wheat has increased, um, and people have tried to delete gliadin genes. Um, the problems with all of this is that it's very much affects the baking quality. So that the reason bread is, or gluten-containing bread is so <coughs> palatable is that it's fluffy and stretchy and all of those qualities that make baking good, but this is all gets affected by these genetic deletions. Um, so the other issue is, is really people's fear of genetic modification and what implications that has for nearby crops and those sorts of practical issues. So the last aspect I'm going to talk about is this inflammatory response that's um, dictated. So people also in the room have also looked at um, this in more detail and worms um, really have attracted a lot of attention in terms of changing the, the hygiene hypothesis and how the hygiene hypothesis may have a role. So we know that all autoimmune diseases are increasing and this is not just because we're recognising it more, it's unequivocally established in celiac disease and diabetes that they're increasing in incidence. Um, and possibly that worms and worm infections and hygiene, the, the decrease that we've seen in that have been responsible for this shift in epidemiology. Um, we know that it's a good treatment for inflammatory bowel disease, so this, this worm, Trichurus surus, which is a, derived from a, a pig, um, 
only lives for a short time in humans, which was one of the limiting factors in its use, but it, it works well in inflammatory bowel disease. Um, so this worm, the Nakata americanus, was used um, in a study that Bob and Jason were involved with. It was 10 infected patients compared to 10 controls. Um, it was good in getting a research model up and running, and it was a very sort of good research model from that point of view, but the results from this initial study were a little bit disappointing. But the doses were very high in terms of the gluten that were being used and not necessarily what you would encounter on a gluten-free diet. And maybe there are other applicabilities to this, um, but certainly food for thought. So this is a study that we're running through um, Eastern Health. So we're looking at anti-inflammatories in celiac disease. So this is a randomised study, double-blinded, placebo-controlled trial. But we're looking at people with newly diagnosed celiac disease. So people who have recently been diagnosed and we're using effervescent budesonide, which is a corticosteroid that is very efficiently metabolised by the liver. So there are very few systemic or body toxicities. Um, and we're looking at it as an induction therapy. So most diseases that we know about, inflammatory diseases, have induction with an anti-inflammatory followed by maintenance with something. So in this study, we're looking at induction with budesonide, this um, corticosteroid, and maintenance is the gluten-free diet. So we're trying to improve the healing rates that I presented earlier were not so satisfactory in celiac disease. So all of these compounds on the left-hand side, they're all involved in celiac disease, um, and as a result of their involvement in celiac disease and inflammatory bowel disease, um, antibodies and anti-these anti compounds have been developed. The problem with these is that they have sort of toxicities when you block them in other tissues. So we use anti-TNF drugs in inflammatory bowel disease a lot. Um, they do have toxicities associated with them. But if you have antibodies to a lot of these, unfortunately, you do get systemic toxicities. And at the moment, they're really sort of restricted to people with refractory celiac disease. Um, not necessarily all of them are easily accessible. So hopefully I've sort of taken you through each step in this process and shown you where the research stands in terms of therapeutics. Um, the other thing which I haven't touched on is really other things in celiac disease. Um, we've got, we have studies running at Box Hill Hospital, three-day blinded gluten challenge, but we're looking at cognitive tests, but we're also looking at what effect a gluten challenge has in a placebo environment. What I've tried to do is sort of also show you how things have changed. So we've looked at this model of and the paradigm that is the traditional paradigm. There's a newer paradigm that I think we sort of follow more so nowadays. So we're seeing more and more people with atypical symptoms. Um, we're seeing more people with associations rather than gut symptoms. Um, we're seeing people with complications and we're picking it up incidentally when we're doing an endoscopy for another reason because we know now very much what it looks like at endoscopy. Um, I haven't touched on the newer antibodies we've got available, they're certainly available to us. Newer endoscopic techniques, there's newer guidelines that perhaps suggest we can avoid endoscopy, which is slightly controversial. We've got more choice, um, these ancient grains that are um, being looked at in more detail, uh, more rigorous follow-ups, follow -up, and I've hopefully given you a bit of an insight um, into the next frontier in gastroenterology. There's a lot I haven't covered, so there's a lot of research in celiac disease that is ongoing. Um, I obviously haven't covered the vaccine, which is the topic for the rest of the evening, um, but it's very much alive and, alive and kicking in terms of what is going on in celiac disease. And that's all I've got to say. Thank you, Evan. I think if we've got a couple of minutes for questions, if anybody has any questions directly for Evan. Yes, down here. My question is, uh, in people who carry the genetic mutation, if the condition becomes unmasked after um, a gastroenteritis type illness, such as, say, rational for example, um, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, look, it's... Yeah, it's something that's always interested me. I don't think we've ever really understood why people develop celiac disease at a later age. And there's unequivocally, there are people who have had normal small bowels who develop celiac disease at some point in their lifetime. And certainly infections um, may have a role in it, and it may have to do with the breakdown of the barrier that I was talking about beforehand in the setting of those infections. 
Um, but I don't think it's very well understood, and I don't think that the, it's going to take a very large epidemiological and epidemiological and scientific study to really establish that firmly. I had a discussion um, at another university with uh, Fritz Koning from Utrecht, who's a guru on kid epidemiology mm. over there, and he uh, learned that things like retroviruses, etc., which are quite common when it comes to young children in European cities, uh, can be a trigger for somebody who's already got the genetic mutation, but it's done okay until then. Yeah. Uh, there's certainly a role for it, and it's, it's something that the actual processes, I just don't think, are that well understood. Anyone else? Yes, in the middle here. You mentioned the increase in the increase. Oh. <laughs> You mentioned the increase in gluten in wheat over the years. Are you talking of 100 years, 1,000 years, and also what type of increase? So well, the quantitation of increase is difficult, but in terms of, we're talking centuries, so we're talking about the ancient grains and the genetics of the ancient grains are very different to what the genetics of their modern wheat are, and people are working to try and sort of gain back that outbreeding um, that happened as a result of that. Um, so it, this is Egyptian times, so it's a, it's a long period of time that we're talking over. Um, but it, it, it was, it's easier to grow the newer wheat and harder to grow the older ones, and it's just the practicalities of farming that have dictated that over many, many centuries. Um. Okay. Oh, just one here, so if we could pass it back. Thank you. Uh, how uh, non uh, good question. <laughs> it's another lecture. Um, look, it's, it, there's, there's good research that's been done and published research that I've been involved with, and, and there appeared to be a very clear link with um, the development of symptoms in people with non celiac gluten intolerance on exposure to gluten. Um, but that's really the only study that's been done and we weren't able to, in terms of a well-designed double-blind study, that's the only one that's been done so far and we weren't able to really establish why that is. So we looked at antibodies, so celiac type antibodies. Um, we looked at fecal markers, so markers in the stool that tell us about inflammation. <coughs> um, we looked at these intestinal permeability tests that I alluded to in um, some of the other studies and we just really found no link. So that's been taken a step further, and that research will hopefully be released soon. There'll be some that'll be presented at, at the gastro conference a bit later on in the year as to whether there are some other mechanistic type insights. Um, but it isn't isn't that well understood at the moment as to why that happens. Okay. Thank you, Evan. Thank you, everyone. Now, I'd like you to, to introduce Leslie Williams. Leslie has more than 20 years of experience in the industry of healthcare management, commercial product development, and marketing. In 2010, Leslie founded Immusan Tea, which subsequently acquired the assets of Melbourne, Australia based Nexpep after advising the company for a year. Uh, Ms. Williams serves as Director, President and CEO of Immusan Tea. So I'd like to welcome Leslie to speak on the company objectives which include advancing the immunotherapeutic celiac vaccine and the diagnostic text tests for celiac disease. Welcome Leslie, thank you. Thank you Jane. Can you all hear me? Thank you, Jane, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. This is a beautiful facility and this inaugural event. I um, feel very honored to be here. Um, let me first by, start by saying, um, actually, make sure I get to the slides. Do you know where? Oh, they'll do it upstairs. Okay. Let me first tell you a little bit about Immusan Tea. Um, Immusan Tea is a Cambridge, Massachusetts company. And we, as was mentioned earlier, we are a very small core team. Um, Dr. Bob Anderson, who you all know very well, um, and uh, Dr. Patrick Griffin is our uh, chief medical officer. He is a gastroenterologist and comes with uh, over 20 years of experience in, in the pharmaceutical uh, development um, role. So we are very uh, lucky to have him join us to help us advance the, the technology and advance the work that Bob has uh, done over the last decade. So um, 
we, uh, we are focused on advancing the therapeutic vaccine and, um, and also the, the building a toolkit to understanding exactly what's going on in the immune system. So, okay, so we are here because uh, of the patients and the unmet needs. And I think Dr. Newman actually, uh, as, you, as you saw from his slide, there's only one option for patients today, and that is, that is a gluten-free diet. So we're here to provide an option for these patients and uh, to provide uh, a therapeutic option so that uh, we can restore tolerance to gluten and allow patients to return to a normal diet. I mentioned this earlier, our strategy is to advance the core technology um, that Bob had and, and uh, Dr. Tai Din have been developing over the last decade, and that is uh, the therapeutic vaccine, Nexvax2, as well as the diagnostic. We, we expect that by providing uh, the, the attention to the therapeutic that we will bring um, a, an increased awareness for, for, those, uh, for the, the industry as well as um, the clinicians that are treating these patients. So we, we have spent a lot of time talking to patients and, and one of the things that we see consistently around the, a lot around the globe is that gluten-free diet is, is celiac, living with celiac disease is not normal and a gluten-free diet is very challenging to, uh, to uh, abide by. So it's, it's not practical and we want to provide an option for, these, for, for all of you. There are many uh, issues, uh, management issues that uh, patients face and again, awareness is, is just one of them. Um, Again, the, diag the average time from symptom to diagnosis is on uh, approximately nine to 10 years from symptom to, uh, to actually being treated. So we are here to, to shorten that time frame and to provide, uh, again, to provide an option for, for patients. Bob will go through, uh, in a moment, uh, we'll go through what the technology is about, but we, we do have uh, the therapy, uh, which is an intradermal injection, which, uh, which again, um, is, does provide a, um, um, a treatment uh, to replace the normal, uh, to, to replace a gluten-free diet. And uh, again, using the same technology, we intend to provide um, um, a diagnostic that will, uh, again, help us pre-select the patients that will respond to, to the treatment. Uh, again, where we are right now is looking at celiac disease as a model uh, indication. It is we're developing uh, again this tolerizing uh, peptide immunotherapy. Uh, we have defined the the specific antigens, which again um, we we intend to um, advance and provide uh, provide in an intradermal injection. Bob will go through the details of of the uh, phase one clinical trial that was completed here in Melbourne at the end of uh, 2010, and we'll talk about where we're going in the future. We are advancing uh, the therapeutic. We are in the uh, later stage phase, phase one. Uh, we're look, exploring different treatment, uh, different uh, dosing options and, and um, advancing, advancing the technology um, with um, a much larger patient group, uh, both in Australia, as well as uh, we have opened, uh, filed an IND in the United States. Along with this, we are developing our companion diagnostic as well as a standalone diagnostic. Uh, from the, what we learn in, uh, in, these clinical in this clinical trial, we intend to um, leverage and expand to other, uh, other, op other autoimmune diseases. But the, while there, we've come a long way, we have a long ways to go, and I think it's important for you all to realize that um, if you see where we are today, we have, uh, we have several years ahead of us and a lot of funding that is required to advance and, and bring this product to market. Uh, the average cost to bring in a drug to market is between 800 million and a billion dollars, and uh, where we are uh, now is uh, with the, available funding to take us through the phase two 
to be, but with success, we believe that we can continue to, to have the capital to bring this product to market. But the journey, uh, the journey uh, does have risk. We aren't there yet. Um, it is also important to note that less than 10% of products entering into uh, phase one are actually approved. So while, while we have come a long ways, we have a long ways to go, uh, Bob is going to go through where we are now and where we're, we're going, but um, again, realizing that uh, um, the journey is, is really just beginning. So with that, I'm going to introduce, uh, introduce Bob. Thank you, Leslie. Can you hear me now? Yep. Thank you very much for coming along and uh, talking about the company and the, the way, the direction it's going. And uh, it's, it's wonderful to hear that there is um, movement there in the United States. It's fabulous. So, so now, of course, I need to bring our friend Bob along. Dr. Robert Anderson, fondly known as Bob, is the, event, is the inventor of Immusantee's technology in celiac disease and has led its development since 1999. He is an internationally recognised leader in celiac disease and Bob has a long-standing association with the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute, where we are today, where he led the research dedicated to understanding immunology of celiac disease and defining the disease-causing components of gluten. This year, Bob re relocated to the USA to further his research in the role of Chief Scientific Officer at Immusanti. So I'd like you all to welcome Bob and give him a warm welcome back to Melbourne. Um, so it's a real pleasure to be back. And I thought it was a good idea to have this lecture, really because it marks a a very important change in the progress we're making towards a, a therapy for celiac disease. So I thought one of the key th messages for you and I think for, for the Institute is that none of this would have been possible had it not been for the relationship with the Celiac Society. And one of the things I was, am always proud of is that there were no lives lost in this drug development program. Um, <laughs> until we got to the point of having to do work in mice. And, and I think that was the real strength in the end. Where what gives me confidence in this program is that we didn't just come across these um, peptide fragments because a mouse chose to react to it. And when you read most of the breakthroughs, that you, you, might, you might read about them or see them on TV, it's usually about mice. And this is about people. And it's about your immune systems and the way you react to gluten and the effect it has on your life and the requirement for a lifelong gluten-free diet. So I guess um, the, the, the theme that has really come through in celiac disease world is that you don't make progress unless you work with patients and you study how their system is reacting to gluten. And I thought I'd just take you through why we're here today and what we expect in the future and what the realistic prospects might be for the way celiac disease could be managed or even prevented in the future. So you heard Evan speak to you about Wilhelm Dickey. He was the discoverer that, that gluten was the cause of celiac disease. Prior to Dickey's work, there was, a, there was an incredibly high mortality rate. So about a third of children with celiac disease died of the condition in the 1930s. So, for people like yourselves with, who may have celiac disease, the research that was done by Dickey changed your lives. It meant that A, you didn't die, but B, it required you to have a special diet. And Dickey came across the, 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 the gluten as being the key driving toxic factor in celiac disease because he developed a test that could measure fat in the bowel motions. And that doesn't sound or smell particularly nice. But it meant that you could measure when celiac disease was reactivated. And he showed that if you took a child, as shown here, who was on a special diet which avoided cereals and then reintroduced wheat or rye or oats, then you reactivated their, their disease 
and they then showed more fat in the bowel motion. So you had an objective tool to test whether people had redeveloped celiac disease. So he showed that gluten was the critical part of, uh, of these cereals driving the condition, and he showed that there was a component in that gluten which, was the, which apparently held the toxic <coughs> factor, which was called gliadin. But even at the time Dickey was doing his work, there was no objective way of diagnosing celiac disease. So it was all based on symptoms. And it was really only later in the 1950s and 1960s that it was possible to, to biopsy the intestine. And when people were able to do that, they found that the typical changes in celiac disease, villus atrophy and what Evan was speaking about, which have now evolved as the way that doctors will diagnose patients, or you would like to think. So the ability to biopsy the intestine made a huge change to actually <coughs> defining what the disease was. And work by Charlotte Anderson here in Melbourne at the Royal Children's Hospital showed that you could heal the gap with a gluten-free diet. So you could restore the villi and the function of the intestine by going on a gluten-free diet. It's important, just before I go on with that, we, we are increasingly concerned by the number of people who adopt gluten-free diets without a diagnosis being made formally. And so you look back on what were the real landmark discoveries in the 1950s and 60s. And it's very sad, I think, now to see that, that people aren't actually taking advantage of those breakthroughs and they simply go on a gluten-free diet without a clear diagnosis. And that's, if you like, an emerging uh, need is to find better diagnostics that um, we can really diagnose people because they won't be suitable for treatments that come along like what we're working on unless they have a clear diagnosis. For me, the next big landmark in celiac disease was the sequencing of the first gluten protein. So this was work from California, Don Casada, who was able to purify one of the gluten proteins. Up till then, no one really knew uh, what was in the gluten because there were so many proteins. There were literally hundreds of proteins that together form the gluggy mess, which is what gluten is. So there were hundreds of proteins. And one of the one of the memories I have when I began my work in celiac disease in Oxford was um, when the, the leader of the group, uh, Derek Jewell, opened this cupboard door and pulled out these huge uh, chromatography columns which had been used to try and purify gluten proteins unsuccessfully. Um, and so this was a real, real breakthrough. So to know the chemistry of the gluten proteins allowed people then to look at the, the components within that protein that might be driving the disease process. The next um, real change in the celiac world was in the late 1980s when the genes, the most important genes in celiac disease, were pinpointed by a group in Norway, Ludwig Solid and Eric Thorsby. And they showed that there was a, a critical gene we now call DQ2, HLA DQ2. And this was the gene that you found in over 90% of the patients with celiac disease. And they showed definitively that this was the gene uh, that was responsible for celiac disease. And we, went, we now know that almost 100% of patients with celiac disease have either the DQ2 gene or a, or a different version, DQ8 gene. If you don't have those genes, then you can rule out celiac disease. They went on um, four years later and showed that this gene functions by allowing the immune system to see gluten and react to it. And so the cells that react to gluten, the T cells, the lymphocytes, are reacting and recognizing particular, <coughs> apparently at this time, um, particular components of the gluten because they were being bound and presented by this DQ2 molecule. So that meant that the field had moved from 1950, discovering that gluten was the, was the toxic factor, if you like, in wheat and rye and <coughs> barley and sometimes oats, to then knowing that it was an immune disease. It was, it was the immune system that was recognizing gluten through these T cells. Um, but what was the holy grail? It was to know what it was in the gluten that was driving the disease process. And so, even though the Norwegians had discovered the lymphocytes, they couldn't work out what it was that was within the gluten which was stimulating the T-cells. And they knew there must be toxic peptide components. So when I arrived in Oxford in 1998, um, having had 
six years of really just doing clinical work at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. I had no knowledge of celiac disease apart from that it was there and you could do a blood test and biopsy for it. And so I, I began learning about immunology and I was in a malaria vaccine group in Oxford and they were going to try to work, going to Africa to try and work out what it was that was um, that you could use to make vaccines for malaria. And I thought you could use the same principles to work out what it was in gluten that made it toxic. And so you can look at you can look at protein sequences, for example, in gluten, and you can break them up into components, and you can see if lymphocytes in blood or elsewhere are recognizing particular parts. This was a standard approach. But it meant that you could screen proteins. But when I looked in patients' blood, I found nothing. I couldn't find cells that reacted to gluten. And so I spent quite a long time thinking and trying to understand the history of celiac disease and why people thought what they thought. And it seemed to me that the way to find out what, you, what was triggering the immune response would perhaps be to reactivate the immune response by people with celiac disease on a gluten-free diet eating bread, so eating gluten, reactivating the disease process. Because I thought that this was a bit like an infection. One day you're well, the next day you're unwell, and you have an immune response generated by this. And so out of that evolved what we call, now call the three-day challenge. It was that if someone with celiac disease on a strict gluten-free diet ate bread for three days, two, two slices of bread twice a day, you could discover the T cells reacting to gluten looking at the blood. And in this study uh, that you can see on the left hand side, it shows you that there's just one part of the, of the gluten protein um, just down here where there are spots. Each spot is a lymphocyte reacting to one of the components of this gluten protein. And they weren't there before. So this meant that you could pinpoint what it was in the gluten protein that was being recognized by the immune response in these patients when they ate gluten. But if they didn't eat gluten, then there was nothing. Thank you. Um, if, you if the person didn't eat gluten, um, you couldn't measure anything. So this is completely negative. But four days, and typically six days later, you could suddenly find these cells reacting. And so this looks um, not particularly impressive. But in Easter of 1999, I spent the day, after seeing spots, um, thinking that the world had changed. <laughs> and my wife was not impressed because she wanted to go on holiday to Europe for Easter. And I stayed back um, looking at spots. <laughs> but it turned out that everyone who I studied pretty much um, reacted to just this part of the gluten protein. And that was a remarkable discovery because it meant there was consistency. It meant that anyone who had DQ2 if they ate bread for three days, if they reacted, then they responded to this one part of the gluten protein. No one had ever found anything quite like that before in an immune disease, maybe because they hadn't been able to, to deliver the antigen to reactivate the disease in this way. And that's really one of the beauties of celiac diseases, that you can reactivate the immune response with relative safety without anything too dramatic happening. Um, and you can identify on the basis of that what it is in proteins um, that's driving the immune response. So it turned out that this part of the, of the agladin protein was the culprit. And just about everyone who's actually ADP2, which if you have celiac disease, there's a 90% plus chance that you are ADP2. Your immune system is picking out this particular sequence here. And it's actually because this component, this one amino acid here, has lost um, what we call, it's been deamidated, so it's lost ammonia and it's become an acid instead of an amide if you're a chemist. And this means it can bind to DQ2 much, much more effectively than what it did before. And the immune system is tricked into thinking that this protein is actually more like an infection than it is a food. And so if you have the DQ2, your immune system can recognize this fragment, but in reality only 1 in 20 people who are DQ2 actually react and develop celiac disease. So mostly um, people like me who are DQ2 um, we can eat as much gluten as we like without getting celiac disease, but a few people um, react and that causes celiac disease. So when I reflected, um, after sort of basking in the glory for a few days, um, Easter and my wife not being happy, um, I thought really I hadn't, the job was not finished. 
because it turned out that when you went back and read the literature, everyone in the celiac disease world was simply studying one protein. They all study one protein. And so I thought, if you, if you go and look as the uh, gen genetic revolution was evolving, I could find 300 different proteins, all called gluten, but we'd only studied one. And so what we did when I came back to the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute and Jason Titan joined me to do his PhD, we embarked on a really foolishly ambitious project, which was to try and study all of the known gluten proteins to work out if there were other parts of gluten that were even more important than that one that we discovered in Oxford. And so it took um, 10 years, basically, between the publication of that first paper and the second one, which was through Jason's efforts and a number of others here at Weehai and elsewhere, to screen over 300 different proteins from wheat, rye and barley. And what we discovered was that it depended on what you ate. If you ate barley, you had a, you had a different reaction than if you ate wheat. And if you ate rye, it was different as well. Um, and we were able to eventually come up with a, with a map. I've always liked maps. Um, but, it turned, but maps are even better if you can put colours on them. And so it, it, each of these colours indicates where a particular lymphocyte will react. So if you ate wheat and you then had lymphocytes in your blood circulating that reacted to the wheat, toxic peptide, the one I originally identified, then they recognised uh, all the sequences here in this family of proteins. But it turned out that there were other, as we suspected, that there were other, perhaps even more important parts of the gluten which were not obvious if you only studied wheat. And so uh, it turned out that there were lymphocytes circulating after either eating wheat or rye or barley that reacted to sequences in these proteins that are marked in blue. And then if someone ate barley, but not wheat, then they reacted to sequences found here in, in yellow. Or if they ate rye, they reacted to the brown sequences as well as the blue sequences. And so rather to the shock of our shock, it turned out that you got a different result depending on what your volunteer was prepared to eat. And it, it said, if you look at the slides that Evan showed, um, the rest of the world, I think, still is preoccupied with the notion that it's this sequence in red, which is the toxic sequence, what we call the 33 mer sequence, that this is the sequence. And in fact, the drugs that Evan uh, talked about, they've all been designed on the basis of thinking that this one red toxic sequence is the causative factor in celiac disease. This is clearly wrong. And it, it distresses that we've just come back from a conference in California you walk around the, the research being presented there, they still just focus on that one peptide. So by doing what we've done, and really largely through Jason's efforts and persuading many of you to eat gluten for a few days, um, we've come up with a really very comprehensive map. This is a bit like Captain Cook's journey to the South Pacific. You only have to do it once, but it changes the world. And it means that you don't make the same error again and you don't run into an island which is uncharted. So by knowing this and through the efforts of you swallowing gluten and some of you being unwell, um, this has really changed the world and the way we look at it. And it certainly benefited us in the way we could design and think about new diagnostics and new therapies. So in the end, depends what you eat, depends what um, part of the gluten comes up is most important. But this told us that rather than having one peptide in our vaccine, we needed at least these, uh, these top three um, to really be able to come up with a decent chance of inducing uh, tolerance or in being able to diagnose celiac disease with a blood test, as I'll tell you in a moment. So the bottom line is that this work that we were able to do here with many of you involved um, has really identified the critical part of this disease process. So we knew the genes, um, we knew there were lymphocytes, but we didn't know what, what it was connecting all these pieces together. So by knowing uh, what these gluten peptides are, this is right at the very heart of the disease process in people who have actually DP2. So you swallow the gluten, um, parts of the gluten are resistant to digestion in the human gut, the transcriptaminase enzyme, which happens to be in, our, in all of our intestines, um, modifies these, some of these peptide sequences from gluten and they end up driving the immune response. So this is really important uh, roadmap 
And the drug we're talking about today, Nixvax 2, is really taking advantage of these gluten peptides, which allow you to target only the lymphocytes in our, in our bodies, or your bodies, if you have celiac disease, uh, that are causing the disease. So it even spoke about immunosuppressive drugs. They'll affect every lymphocyte in the body. It won't just be the ones causing celiac disease. Whereas what we're aspiring to do in our diagnostic as well as therapeutic is to target only these lymphocytes, maybe one in a thousand <coughs> or even less, that react to gluten. So you get the benefits of a drug which might dampen down the immune response, but only to gluten, and then leave the rest of your immune system alone. And I think as um, even we're speaking about these other drugs that people have thought about in celiac disease, each of these drugs um, working on the gut barrier or um, enzyme type drugs, they're all attempting to reduce the amount of these peptides, gluten peptides, that are recognized by the lymphocytes. In the end though, if you're on a gluten-free diet, the amount of gluten that you, you eat compared to someone on a normal diet has to be reduced by 99.7%. So it's a, there's a profound, profound reduction in the amount of gluten that you can eat safely in your diet. So in other words, you can't eat gluten if you're on a gluten-free diet with celiac disease. And really that was why I thought that these agents would only ever be a supplement to a gluten-free diet. And I think the, the, the data, the, the paper that Evan showed you why people think that a vaccine might be better than these other approaches is because it's the only one which really, I think, offers the opportunity to return to a normal diet. So the, the va so-called vaccine, Nixvax2, is about changing the way the immune system reacts to gluten. And um, the question was, so people obviously didn't believe us when we said that this was possible um, in the way you might expect. But there were plenty of examples in the research world where you could change the immune response in mice. So we had the opportunity to utilize mice that had been developed across the road at Melbourne University by Jim McCluskey's group. And Kate Keach, who works with, with Jim and Andrea DeCoey, who was a PhD student, um, we were able to utilize these mice to show that you could modify the way the immune system in mice reacts to gluten. So these mice were what we call partly humanized. The gene for celiac disease was introduced in the mice, and they were capable of recognizing these peptides from gluten, or one of them. And it turned out that if you gave one injection of the peptide, then you could stimulate the T cells reacting to that gluten peptide. But if you repeated the injection over two weeks, you could turn off that immune response. So by repeatedly injecting the same thing, you could switch the animal from reacting aggressively to being effectively tolerant. And when we, uh, when we did further work, we found that we quite significantly altered the way the lymphocytes were responding. So they secreted different hormones. They didn't, um, they didn't proliferate, which is a way of showing that they've been activated. And if you followed your, if you like, induction treatment with maintenance, so weekly injections um, at a, dose, a particular dose level, you could maintain that tolerance. So you could per effectively um, permanently change the way that the mouse was reacting to these gluten peptides, provided you maintained the, uh, the exposure. And this is not unlike treatment for allergy. It's not really the same, but it's not that different. It's that you can change the way the immune system reacts and potentially benefit patients with those adverse immune reactions going on. So that set the scene for a clinical trial. And again, some of you I know have been involved in the clinical trials in celiac disease. And I mean, I'm very grateful for those of you who were involved because this is the first time that this drug was used in, in patients with the condition. So we were very keen to know what effect this drug might have. And um, we got our picture in the paper. <laughs> and um, so this is very exciting because it's very seldom that you see a research program get to this point. And we were, uh, we were understandably excited but somewhat anxious before this trial began about what would happen. And it's always what dose you choose 
for the first time you deliver a drug, a new drug to a patient with a condition. And we did a lot of, we thought about it a lot, read a lot of the literature, and we began at, at what we thought was a very low dose, so nine micrograms, it's a tiny amount of the drug, of these three <coughs> component peptides. And um, we didn't really see anything uh, at that dose level, there were no obvious reactions. And we gradually went up in terms of the dose level to 30 micrograms, 60 micrograms, 90 micrograms. And it, it, some people clearly did have symptoms, but when we looked back, it was very hard to see a clear difference between the people who uh, were receiving the placebo, so no drug, or the 9 microgram dose level, and these higher dose levels. So there weren't really enough people to come up with any major statistical analyses, but it appeared that basically this was a drug which was tolerated and it was safe, and it gave us the confidence to really go on with this development program. So we were really doing this for safety and tolerability. But we also wanted to know if this drug was stimulating anything in the immune system related to gluten or the gluten peptides that are in the drug. Um, and so what we saw was that in... I'll show you this. Um, what we were trying to do here was to measure the, the T cells reacting to gluten and the gluten peptides in Nexax2. And in these four individuals, we were able to show that the drug, the injection of the drug, intradermal injection, stimulated the T cells in the blood. So they weren't there before the injections, but then on day six usually, um, but sometimes later, you suddenly began to appear, you began to measure these reacting T cells in the blood. And this may look, look very exciting, but it was the first time, in fact, that anyone had shown in humans with an immune disease that you could reactivate the immune response by injecting what you thought were the right peptides responsible for this disease process. So this gave us confidence that we'd selected the right peptides. And again, this was the first time in a human immune disease that anyone had been able to show that. So together, uh, the result of that phase one study in 34 people with celiac disease was that we were happy with the, with the clinical effects, the symptoms, what the people experienced, and with the blood response and the lymphocytes. So you've got to start somewhere, and that's where we began, and that's really the platform for what's happened in the last two years. So there, there's a long way to go, and I don't want anyone to leave the, this, uh, this lecture with the notion that we have a drug for celiac disease. So where we are now is probably six years away from a drug that's on the market. But if you look at the likelihood of success um, at each way along this pathway from phase one, which is where we've done one phase one, but there will be more phase ones, <coughs> through phase two and phase three, um, there are a lot of people. So you need perhaps a thousand people in a phase three trial. I and mean, this would be a huge study. It would cost, I think, what we're saying here, what, $86 million. Um, a lot of money to be able to do a trial like that, which would be a global study. But you have to get to that point to prove that your drug actually works and protects people from gluten exposure. So we've got a long way to go and we're in, a, in an advanced planning stage for the clinical trial program. And it's critical that we have a structure, which we didn't really have before, that can raise this sort of capital. And this is really where Leslie Williams came in um, and with her expertise, it was possible to move this program from uh, where we were in that phase one study with a relatively small number of people to a program that could eventually lead to this kind of um, infrastructure and capital raising and all the sophisticated things that you need to eventually get a drug approved. And with Patrick, with Patrick Griffin um, involved as well, who's, done, who's been down this path before, um, it improves the likelihood of success, which is ultimately what we want. We, for me, it's that this drug could fail, but if it does fail, then it does it in the best possible way. <laughs> I personally, I'm very optimistic because I think, as I've tried to show you, these peptides from gluten are at the heart of the disease process. So I've, my philosophy is that whatever you do, you have to utilise th these discoveries. No matter where you go in celiac disease, or in any of the, the classic immune diseases.
like type 1 diabetes or MS or rheumatoid arthritis. They're all similar. They're all driven by lymphocytes reacting to particular peptides. So this is really providing a, a roadmap for what could be a new class of drugs. And what we do now and the decisions we make and the, whether we can recruit volunteers for our clinical trials all for the work that Jason's, Jason Titan's doing here at WeHi with Group and Challenges will determine whether we can create this new class of drugs. We don't, I think as physicians, we've talked about this, as physicians we don't want to poison our patients. It's bad. Um, <laughs> but each drug we create is an improvement on the previous one. And I think we all recognise that it's, it, it was certainly life-changing for patients to have these biological agents in fliximab and others. But we also know that they cause lymphoma and some patients get TB and that's bad. So even though their disease might be better, we don't want the, the toxic effects. And this class of drug that we're talking about, I think is, is really the most exciting new development in this field for, for many, many years because it offers a very precise way of modifying the immune response. So what do we need if we're going to advance this field and for people with celiac disease to have a better life? So I can't stress enough, you need a diagnosis. There is no point going on a gluten-free diet without knowing if you have celiac disease or whether it's irritable bowel or whether it's something else. So it's, it's really pivotal that being involved in the celiac society or being a physician, it's that people are properly worked up. You don't just go on a gluten-free diet. So if there is a suspicion about celiac disease, you have the right tests, you have a biopsy, and this remains the gold standard, even though what we're doing may eventually supersede that. But the biopsy and the antibody test provides the, the best possible way to get a correct diagnosis of celiac disease. And if you are on a gluten-free diet, I think all of us feel quite guarded and somewhat pessimistic that it will be very hard to induce immune tolerance to gluten if your gut is not adequately healed and your diet is not strict. It may be one day we find a way to deal with patients immediately after they're diagnosed, but our immunology knowledge today indicates that it would be much easier to introduce tolerance to gluten if the gut is not inflamed. So we need patients who are strictly gluten-free who have been properly diagnosed. The other part about this drug is a very interesting part of what the pharmaceutical world is now uh, trying to do. There's no point treating patients with a drug if you know they won't benefit from it. And even though that may have been a pharmaceutical model was that half the people you treat don't benefit, it's actually not what the, the government wants to do. There's no point paying for a drug or people being exposed to a drug that they may have adverse events to if they won't benefit from it. And this, the drug we're developing, Nexfax2, um, is, do, is designed for people who have the DQ2 genetic background. So it won't work in people who, uh, who don't have the DQ2 gene. Having said that, this is 80 to 90% of the people with celiac disease. And there may well be ways to improve upon this type of drug by looking at the other parts. But at the moment, um, it is clearly for the people with these genes. And having the gene test has not really been a major part of management of celiac disease, but I think it will become so, and we need people who have that gene. So the bottom line is that through, through good fortune, I've had the opportunity to, to be a kind of discoverer, but it was largely through luck, um, of finding a way to know what it is in gluten that's driving this immune response. But over the 14 years that I've been involved, it's been possible through the collaboration really with the patients who are affected with the celiac society to get to this point where we're now really, uh, I guess, we're a lot closer to a treatment for celiac disease and a new diagnostic for celiac disease using blood than when I began my work 14 years ago. So for me, if we are successful, it'll be a 20-year project. And for me, it means that I'm 70% of the way through that project um, today. And I think for all of you, it's that there, there is you know, remarkable progress in celiac disease. The progress is that you're actually diagnosed now, um, but still six out of seven of people with celiac disease in Australia are not diagnosed. So it's still fundamental that, that your doctors need to know about celiac disease. But if you are diagnosed and you look forward to a gluten-free life, 
uh, one day you may have an alternative and you may return to normal diet. But we need you to be involved in this program, to be involved in our studies, our basic understanding studies, and ultimately in clinical trials. And Melbourne now occupies an unusual role in the world. And this is why I wanted to call this the global perspective. It's that many people in the drug development world come to Melbourne to do clinical trials on celiac disease because there are a lot of people diagnosed and by and large you're well behaved. You, <laughs> you, most of you follow a gluten-free diet and there is a, a good availability of gluten-free food. And many of you have had gene tests and we know a lot more about people here than we do in the United States for example. So one of the one of the interesting things about what we're doing now is to see if we can make the United States more like Melbourne um, in terms of celiac disease. And so that there's now this cross-fertilisation of ideas and, and I think contrasting attitudes about gluten-free and celiac disease between the two countries. So I'll stop there, but it, it's been a, an extraordinary life experience for me that my research actually went somewhere um, and that we're actually now at a point where we're working with you to develop a drug and a new diagnostic. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure we might have a few questions for Bob, so please, I'd like you to come back. <laughs> Thank you, Bob, and I'm sure everybody's learned a lot more than they knew. Um, I'm so glad that you had spots in your eyes and, and the uh, family uh, sacrificed you while they had a lovely European trip. I don't know which one I would have done, but anyway, so thank you for that. Um, I'd like to see if anybody has any questions. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm interested in the fact that <coughs> research shows that people on a gluten free diet can sh still have the antibodies. Is, does that mean that they're is it still active or is it an that's So the work that went in to discover those antibodies and then to make them into a useful diagnostic test was focused on trying to identify people in the community who had untreated celiac disease. The test was really a diagnostic rather than a, a monitor. And the utilisation of it as a monitoring tool came much later when it was found that people on a free diet generally lost those antibodies. They didn't always return absolutely to normal, but they generally went down quite significantly. So partly it's because we've been over-ambitious in utilising those tests. But it does seem in some people that they do have elevated levels, and if they are eating gluten, then the test usually indicates that there is gluten exposure. What Evan, I think, was indicating to you was that many people who still have damage in the gut are not identified by that blood test. And this is really where the, the field has been led somewhat astray and why we've, in some cases, gone back to repeating the biopsy to look at healing. And when we have gone back and looked at healing, I think we've been shocked in some studies by how many still have significant damage. Because as Evan told you, uh, it would seem in some of those people that they, do, they are the ones who get the complications later. Next question. Can you explain to me why the gene test is in the gold standard in diagnosis as opposed to going to hospital, having an anaesthetic, having a tube stuck down you to get a diagnosis? Yeah. It just seems so much nicer having a blood test. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's really doctors live in their own world and they like doing things. And, uh, in some countries there's a vested interest in biopsies, but it is that the biopsy has evolved as the gold standard. It's arguable now whether it should be the only gold standard, and it really should be interpreted in the context of these other tests. And the more, uh, when Jason and I started doing our, our work here in Melbourne and began utilising the gene test, we were beginning to find that some of our volunteers had the wrong genes for celiac disease even though they had biopsy reports indicating that they were celiac. And so we became very conscious that the gene test added quite a significant 
amount of information on top of the biopsy and the antibody test. And I think for, for some of you, you probably didn't have an antibody test that was positive, but you had a biopsy which was positive. And some of you may have attended Mark and Mackey's lectures when he was here a couple of years ago. And Mark has really pioneered not only the blood test, but the biopsy. And he reminds us frequently that if you happen to process the biopsy incorrectly, so you slice it obliquely rather than um, vertically, it can appear that you have villus atrophy. So every test you do, there's an opportunity for a false positive or a false negative. But the gene test is wonderful because your genes don't change no matter what you eat. And in principle, the gene test should be extremely accurate because it's a, a very direct lab-based test. So my view is that the laboratory tests are generally much easier to control than the histology, for example, but there have been improvements in the biopsy techniques. So what we want to ensure, and through the efforts of the CEA Society, is that if you do go forward for a gastroscopy, for example, that you will have at least five biopsies collected from the right parts of the small intestine, and that you will have been told to eat gluten at least four slices of bread a day for a month before that test. And even better would be if people had the blood test for celiac disease before they went forward for a gastroscopy. Because we find that quite a lot of patients with celiac disease have undergone more than one gastroscopy before the diagnosis is made, and that's very unfortunate. And I think in the, in the end that all of these issues feed into our objective at MSMT is to develop a blood test which would provide you a definitive diagnosis. And that the gene test become a standard part of the workout. Um, at the time you have a positive antibody test. Um, just on the vaccine itself, um, I'm just wondering if there's any, or two quick questions, if there's any insight into the scheduling or the dosing schedule of the vaccine itself, if, if you've kind of got that far. And the second question, I'm not sure if I missed um, the part, but are the peptides actually conjugated to an immunoactive compound or are they just in a buffer solution? Um, so what we, what we utilised the animal model for was to establish ways of treating a mouse to establish tolerance, to show that it could work. That doesn't necessarily mean that those are the best ways of treating a human. And so the clinical trial program um, at least in the initial half, is really about optimising the way to deliver the drug and to establish immune tolerance in a fashion that is acceptable to patients, that it's safe um, and that it works. So a lot of what we do is in the patient and it'll be that we need to customise this because people haven't largely developed such a, a drug before. So you need humans with the condition to do that, and we don't want to extrapolate just from mice to do that. The way these drugs work is not by utilising adjuvants, or well, so far that's the case, as you would a normal vaccine for pre preventing an infection. So this drug at the moment is simply the pure peptides, there's no adjuvant, and that's why it was remarkable and reassuring to see T-cells in the blood after an injection of just pure peptides, and that's, as you know, probably immunologically, that indicates that there are memory, what we call memory cells that are there that have been reactivated. Um, and that means that people with celiac disease who got these injections have those memory cells there, um, presumably waiting to recognise gluten. Yeah. Um, someone on this side. Well, is it reasonable to, uh, or logical to suggest that those of us with CD don't have the adequate proteinases secreted by, into the gut to sufficiently digest the gluten proteins in order to make them non-allergenic? And secondly, you've mentioned both drugs and vaccines. Are you really talking synthetic, chemically produced drugs or proteinaceous based vaccine? Um, so if you have celiac disease, you don't break down the gluten proteins efficiently and there are residual peptides that go on to stimulate the immune response. Is that but, due to our genetic uh, disposition rather than the other 99% of the population? So we're all in the same boat. None of us digest gluten 
So you're not special. It's not an image. So the, well, you are special. But <laughs> in that respect, you're not special. No, it's because none of us adequately, we've not been designed to degrade those particular peptides efficiently. So for a long time, people talked about the missing enzyme hypothesis, and they thought that people with celiac disease might be missing a particular enzyme involved in breaking down gluten. Turned out that no one could ever show that there was a deficiency in any particular enzyme in celiac disease. Although people with active celiac disease had reduced levels of all the enzymes, not just the uh, proteases. And when you go on a gluten-free diet, you restore the activity of those enzymes. So it turned out that the enzyme hypothesis was wrong, um, and in fact that all of us couldn't really digest gluten very efficiently. Um, and then the other part of your question, so these are synthetic peptides, so they're made in a, in a factory, they're not from gluten, and by and large, that's a good thing. Um, you know what you're dealing with. And it lifts this field, which has really been based on proteins, by and large, and crude extracts, which is what allergy immunotherapy is about, to very precise utilisation of short so-called peptide fragments. That's important because one of the big drawbacks in allergy immunotherapy is that you can have an allergic reaction to the drug itself. And if you trim down your protein to, as we have, to less than 20 myoacids, it's almost impossible then to get an allergic response. So it's a safety issue, but it's also a, an important pharmaceutical design issue in the way that drugs are built. Okay, we'll just have one more question. Oh, you've had one earlier, so sorry. Um, <laughs> perhaps over there in the middle. Yeah, with the mic, it's just coming to you. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering about how oats fits into um, the wheat dry. Right. So it's always the oat question. <laughs> we get it all the time, Bob. <laughs> um, so we've pondered oats a bit. And there have been a few studies out indicating that oats are safe. And these studies have been done overseas, largely. In Australia and New Zealand, there's always been a view that oats were traditionally contaminated with wheat or rye or barley, and therefore that there was no suitable source of oats, even if oats were safe, because they've been grown in fields or milled in mills with these other grains. And then more recently, over the last perhaps, what, five years, um, so-called contaminant-free oats have become available. They're not called gluten-free, but they're so-called free of contamination. And oats do provide a very useful additional cereal, particularly in people with diabetes. It's got a good glycemic index. And it provides very, a bit of variety in your diet. And so we, we adopted a view in the clinic that if a paint white, if anyway, I think Jason did too, maybe. <laughs> um, is that if you put a patient with a, a normal healed intestine on an oat-containing diet for a period of months and then repeated the biopsy and the, the intestine still looked healthy and normal having had three, three um, meals of oats per week then it was reasonable to continue to eat oats provided they were free of contamination. But the literature when you search it out indicates that there are people who develop illness atrophy on apparently um, only oat diets, no other wheat or rye bone. So there are certainly people who react. Um, it's hard to understand the literature because a number of people drop out of the big trials that people quote, and the people who dropped out may be the ones who are reacting to oats. So uh, I guess we're open-minded about oats and that, that we... Were you to isolate a particular sequence in oats or...? Yeah, we did. We've with uh, Jason's work, we identified a sequence of oats that was recognised by T cells. And another group in Norway did too. And we just presented a poster in Europe showing a kind of cross reactivity between the barley peptide I showed you and the oat peptide. So the, the bottom line is, in the end, you rely upon the clinical studies with biopsies. Um, and they indicate most people can tolerate oats safely, but some do react. And it's knowing who reacts. That's the problem. Yeah, so you can't predict who's going to react. And the blood tests for transcontaminase don't seem to work in people who have active celiac disease while eating oats. So that was why our default position was simply to repeat the biopsy. But that's 
expensive and inconvenient for many people. Okay. I think we'd better finish up now. We have got um, a, a thank you again, Bob, for coming. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we, we are just running a few minutes late, which I hope you'll forgive us, but I think it was worth the wait. Um, in our in the tapestry room out the out out in the foyer, we have got a, a light supper there for you. Um, well and good have kindly donated all the cakes and Swiss rolls. We've also brought in a few um, savoury items for you. Everything is gluten free. There's tea and coffee. Um, but before we do depart, I'd like to thank Walter and Eliza Hall for all the effort they've put in. Maureen and Catherine. <laughs> Um, they've been wonderful in helping us promote the event. Um, I'd like to thank Leslie for coming along tonight, Evan for coming along tonight, and of course Bob again. And uh, I hope you've all enjoyed yourselves. And we hope that if you're not a member of Celiac Victoria at the moment, that you will come back into our fold. We'd love to have you. Thank you very much.